bluff. I know a lot of people bluff randomly. A lot of people have um, pretty good reasoning for when they bluff, but I've developed a flow chart that will help you know when you should bluff. And if you follow the flow chart, you're gonna do way better than if you uh, pure guess. And to be fair, you very often end up with either a good, strong exploitative play or a good, strong GTO play. You decide to bluff when your opponent won't fold top pair. Well, we'll talk about the problem with that. Do you hang out on YouTube or Twitch? I don't think it makes a difference. I know that on YouTube, I have all the ads turned off. So take that for what it's worth. They don't let me do that on Twitch. So yeah, good morning, good morning. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. Before we can understand my flow chart, we need to define a few key terms, okay? Auto calls. These are hands that your opponent will call with. When your opponent has something like top pair, top kicker on an uncoordinated board, that's an auto call. They're not going to fold. When they have a straight on anything besides a four flush board, they're not going to fold. When they have a flush, unless it's a really, really bad one on a four flush board, they're not going to fold, okay? That's what an auto call is. An auto fold is in hand that your opponent will fold to any bet. This is going to be stuff like busted flush draw or ace high that check calls flop and makes a super loose check call on the turn. Now, maybe they check call on the river and all the draws miss, but usually ace high is an auto fold. Um, bottom pair, very often an auto fold when a lot of draws come in. Usually, though, the most clear auto folds are busted draws. So if they're sitting there with eight high on the river and you bet, they're folding, clearly. Also, blockers. A blocker is a card in your hand that makes it more difficult for your opponent to have a relevant hand that will auto call. For example, an auto call on a three flush board would be the nut flush, right? So if you have the, let's say there's three spades on the board, if you have the ace of spades in your hand, you know that you now block some of their auto calls, right? And if you block their auto calls, that's going to be a good reason to bluff. Alternatively, say the board is eight, seven, four, three, two, and you have 10, nine in your hand for a busted straight draw yourself. That's the spot where you actually block some of your opponent's auto folds, which would be the same 10, nine, jack nine, and jack 10. So there you actually have bad blockers, which is kind of interesting. Sometimes when you block the busted flush draw, that's often a bad hand to bluff with because you block some of your opponent's auto folds. Is this included in the tournament masterclass? This is included in the tournament and cash game masterclass because it is vitally important. It's important to understand the bluffing decision flow charts. And I'm happy to share that with all of you here today. Blockers become more relevant as they are realistically found in your opponent's range. For example, say under the gun raises, you call the big blind and it comes, whatever, six, six, four, two. If you have a five or a three blocker to the straight, it's not actually all that relevant because your opponent's range from under the gun does not contain all that many fives or threes, right? So there the blocker's pretty relevant. But if the board is instead something like king, jack, nine, well now a hand like, uh, our hand with a 10 or a, uh, what did I say? King, jack, nine, a hand with a 10 or a queen becomes relevant as a blocker because those are cards your opponent could actually have. Ideally, blockers want to remove combinations from hands your opponent will call with. Those are usually the most relevant blockers. And blockers also become more and more relevant as the bet size increases because typically whenever you are really looking to use blockers, you are hoping to block the effective nut hands. And whenever you are to some extent representing the nuts with a blocker to the nuts, you're going to be using a polarized bet size. Polarized bet sizes are usually big. I discuss this thoroughly in my tournament and cash game master classes. You can check it out at pokercoaching.com. We're actually having a lovely discount right now for Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone out there. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash valentines. Let's see. Most of your barrels get called. You know, Boza. What a lot of people do wrong is they bet the flop, small. They bet the turn, small. They bet the river, small, and they get called. And they wonder, how did they get called? I bet three times. Yeah, well, you bet small. I'm not going to say betting small is necessarily bad with bluff, but it turns out whenever you give your opponent really good pot odds on all three betting rounds, they're going to call. Also, what a lot of people do wrong. They bet big on the flop, their opponent calls. They bet big on the turn, their opponent calls. Then they give up every time. They never make the river bluff for all their money. 
And that's another problem. You're going to find that a lot of people are big calling stations, pre-flop, on the flop, and on the turn. But when all the money goes in, they start to get pretty nitty. I want to thank all of you for being here this morning. Smash the like button if you're enjoying the show. Maybe some of you learned something already. Let's get to it. Bluffing decision flow chart. This is actually part of a grand strategy. This is question number eight. We're skipping one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven for today. Those discuss value betting for the most part. This is all, like I said, included in the tournament and cash game masterclass. This is slide 622 of the post-flop section. All right. If you bet as a bluff, why are you choosing this hand to bluff with? All right, let's start right at the top of this chart. Bluffing decision flow chart. Frequency. How often should we bet? And then once we decide to bet, what size should we bet? And it turns out, if you use this flow chart, you will very often end up with roughly the GTO strategy while also accounting for what your opponent does incorrectly. Okay? Is the opponent capable of folding? Now, I know a lot of people think my opponents never fold. Your opponents probably don't fold to your bad bluffs. But to be fair, will your opponents fold? Are your opponents capable of folding? If they're not, don't bluff. Duh. Duh. Right? Come on. If your opponent's going to call with literally ace high and better every single time for all the money on the river, you bet the flop, they call with ace high. You bet the turn, they call with ace high. You bet the river, all in, they call with ace high every time. If that's your opponent, don't bluff. Okay? Pretty simple, right? Now, obviously that's an extreme example. The question then becomes, will your opponent fold middle pair? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I don't know. Um, sometimes middle pair is great, and it should not be folded for any amount of money. Sometimes middle pair is really bad, and it should be folded immediately. Right? So, you need to figure out, will your opponent fold some portion of the time? Now, capable of folding doesn't mean folding one in a million times. It also doesn't mean folding almost every time. It means, like, will, will, they make fold? will they make reasonable folds? If they will not, don't bluff. Do you lack showdown value? Okay? As your hand cannot win at the river, at the showdown, if your hand cannot win at the showdown, you should be way more inclined to bluff that in general, in general, than when you have some showdown value. Now, something a lot of people get wrong is they do not realize when you have showdown value and when you don't. Quite often, bottom pair on the river in a big pot has no showdown value. And it should be bluffed because it actually blocks full houses in two pairs, even though it's bottom pair. You're going to find, from a GTO point of view, there are plenty of spots where, like, king high should not be bluffed, but bottom pair should be bluffed. And that's because king high often blocks the auto fold, or the auto calls. No, no, no. King high will block the auto folds, which means they're more likely to call. And bottom pair will block the auto calls, which means they're more likely to fold, right? Which is very, very relevant. Next, do you have a lot of hands in your value range? Are there a lot of hands you'd like to bet for value? If there are relatively few, then you don't get to bluff all that often. If there are a lot of value hands in your range, you get to bluff a ton, right? Are your blockers highly relevant? This is a very important point, especially as the pot becomes very big. Okay? If your blockers are relevant, be way more inclined to bluff. If your blockers are not relevant, and when I say relevant, I mean, do they block your opponent's auto calls? Um, I, I realize these two points here are kind of the opposite, right? Do I block my opponent's auto, do I unblock my opponent's auto, auto folds, right? So these are kind of like opposite questions. Are my blockers highly relevant? Like essentially, do they block the auto calls? Yes, this one will then be no quite often, right? So the, these usually are opposite. Does my bluff tell a credible story? Would you actually play bluffs in this, or would you actually play value bets in this manner? Now, what a lot of people do wrong is they have a very weak, straightforward strategy where they play their value hands one way and their bluffs another way. And that's a big problem if you're playing against anyone who has any competency at poker. And you want to make sure that you play some your, your bluffs and your value bets in the same way. Is this for tournaments or cash games? This is for both tournaments and cash games. We're specifically discussing bluffing on primarily the river. Next, once we decide to bluff, once most of these are yes, and by the way, I will say sometimes there is an overriding factor here. So you can have a lot of yeses, but the answer is still no. For example, is your opponent capable of folding? If your opponent is looking at you, showing you top pair and saying, hey, I'm calling no matter what you bet. 
If all of these are yes, but this one over here is no, that's going to be an overriding factor that makes you not bluff. Okay? And to be fair, if this is an exploitative question, right? Quite often, the exploitative plays will override the GTO plays, as they logically should, right? If you know your opponent's not folding, don't bluff, even if you have a very, very, very obvious, normally obvious bluffing hand. Um, sometimes your blockers. Are your blockers highly relevant? If the answer is yes, and all these other questions are like mixed, quite often the blockers question is going to be very, very relevant. You have to use a little bit of logic and poker skill to figure out which factor is most relevant. And, and quite often it's not going to be very clear cut. All right, once we decide we're going to bluff, what size do we use? Do we have no showdown value? If we have no showdown value, usually you want to bet big. Not always from a GTO point of view. It GTO mixes it up, but for simplicity, it is important to note, I am teaching an implementable strategy. I'm not trying to teach you how to play perfect GTO poker. I'm trying to teach you a strategy that roughly replicates GTO poker. You can actually implement at the poker table. It's very important to realize we are not robots. I'm not some kind of super genius here that makes the perfect GTO play every time. I realize there are some players out there who can, to some extent, do that. That's not me, and that's not most people. All right, do we have no showdown value? If, as we have less and less showdown value, we should be more inclined to bet big. Why? Because when we have no showdown value, we really, really, really don't want to get called. When we have some showdown value, quite often, you're going to find that we want to bet small. Again, GTO mixes this up, but for simplicity, you're going to find, at least I'm going to find, at least I've found, that in my experience, when you bet small, sometimes your opponents make insanely loose hero calls. Whenever you bet the bottom pair for a third pot, sometimes they call with ace high. Would you rather have bottom pair bluffing for a third pot, or would you rather have eight high bluffing for a third pot, if they're going to call some portion of the time with some hero calls, right? Obviously, you'd rather have the hand with some showdown value. Now, now, the alternative logic to this is that whenever you bet small with eight high and your opponent folds, that's a gigantic success, right? Because you're making some better hands fold. So uh, it, it depends on your opponent, right? Depends on your opponent to some extent. But anyway, I usually use this strategy. Does my opponent have many marginal made hands in the range? Marginal made hands are usually auto calls for small bets, but auto folds for big bets. If you can tell your opponent's range is a lot of hands like middle pair and worse because they check raise the flop in the turn with top pair and better, right? Maybe that's what they do. But that means when they check call flop and check call turn, then they have a lot of marginal made hands. If they have a lot of marginal made hands, you typically want to bet big because you're trying to get them to fold those, right? They will call a small bet. They will fold to a big bet. So you want to be betting big when they have a lot of marginal made hands. Now, the alternative to this is what if they have a lot of nuts or nothing? What if your opponent's range is a lot of rivered, whatever draw came in, like a rivered flush, or some bust, other busted draw, like busted straight draw? If they have eight high or the nuts, you want to bet small, right? Because you're going to get eight high to fold to any bet size, and you're never going to get a flush to fold, right? So if their range is very polarized, you want to be more inclined to bet small. Do you block many nut hands? As you block more nut hands, you want to be betting big because you can then essentially represent a polarized range, right? When you don't block nut hands, often that's going to lead you to betting small. Are you trying to get your opponent off of a decently strong hand? Now, when I say strong, I don't mean nuts or top pair, top kicker. I mean, you know, top pair, no kicker, middle pair, good kicker. If you're trying to get them off of a pretty good hand, you typically want to bet large. If you're trying to get them off of a small, or if you're trying to get them off of a relatively weak hand, like ace high, you can often bet small, right? Are you representing a nut hand? If you're representing a nut hand, bet large. If you're not, bet small. If you're representing a whole lot of top pair no kickers, which sometimes is the case, then you often want to bet medium or small, right? Don't blush fish calling stations. Yeah, that's point number one. We are trying to uh, learn a little bit more than that, okay? I sound like denial Negranu, okay? 0.75x speed, please. Yeah, I do go a little bit fast. Sorry, we have a lot to get through. If everyone plays GTO, it's gambling. Yeah, fortunately, almost no one plays GTO. Are you watching right here? I'm, I'm specifically saying don't play GTO in most spots. You've been watching two minutes. You're already a better bluffer. Good, that's what we're going for. Is GTO the best strategy? And everyone should play this way. Or is it just your expert opinion? Depends on your... Well, you should be playing massive... You should exploit whatever your opponents do wrong. You need to learn how to play good, strong, fundamentally sound poker so you know where to start from. 
and they need to learn how to adjust to take advantage of whatever your opponents do incorrectly. If you're enjoying this, click the like and subscribe. Yeah, for sure. Does the stack depth matter? Yes, this presumes we're playing relatively deep stack and we have money left behind to bet. If on the river, you somehow get to the river and your opponent has two big blinds left and the pot's 100, you screwed up. Okay? Why are you doing these precious lessons for free? Why not? Happy to help all of you. I appreciate all of you being here and I'm happy to share my information with you. To be fair, I'll tell you. Ideally, some of you learn from this. Some of you go and you implement this at the table and some of you are gonna go out there and you're gonna win a whole lot of money playing poker. And whenever you decide to learn poker more, you know who you're gonna think about? Me. And you're gonna go to pokercoaching.com. If you go right now to pokercoaching.com slash valentines, get a big discount. And then I make some money off this. Otherwise we make no money off this. As you see, we have no ads on YouTube, on Twitch. I think we make uh, about $8 a month. So thanks to Twitch for that. Um, we make money whenever you sign up for pokercoaching.com. So happy to give away this information so that maybe, maybe just one day you want to pay me back in some way. All right, let's go through an example. You raise the three blinds preflop from the button with queen, jack, and diamonds and get a caller from the big blind who's a somewhat of a calling station. All right. You continuation bet a third pot on the flop. Turn goes check, check. And the big blind checks you on the river. We have queen, jack of diamonds. All right. Use the bluffing decision flow chart to see if we should bluff. If you decide to bluff, should we bet big or small? Take a second. Think about it. Think about if we should be bluffing this river with the queen high. Are these flowcharts on PokerCoaching.com? Yes, this is in the Cash Game and Tournament Masterclass at PokerCoaching.com. Those are 35 plus hour long courses that teach you everything you need to know to beat those games. Tell me in the chat, are we betting this or are we not betting this? Matt says, from the free content alone, you've gone from breaking even to up $1,000 this year. Good job, good work. Always happy to hear all of you crushing the game. No one's typed in if they're going to bluff here or not. Bluffing Queen High folds out some better hands. Sure. Got bet, bet. You don't know what we're repping? I suppose we'd be representing a hand like a 10 here, right? We'd definitely check back a 10 on the turn, unless, of course, we think the opponent's going to call three bets with a 10. I think we could even value at a hand like pocket eights. Maybe even value at a six against the calling station. We have check, we have bet, bet, bet. A lot of you say bet. Let's take a look at the flow chart. Is the opponent capable of folding? Eh, somewhat of a calling station. Probably not. Do you lack showdown value? Interesting question here. Because we actually have some showdown value. If you think about it. The opponent is going to check call with some flush draws on the flop, a lot of which are low ones. The opponent's also going to have random hands like jack eight on the river sometimes. You may say they'd obviously bluff that. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. If this was king high, I think we definitely have a lot of showdown value. But queen high, eh, maybe, maybe a sprinkle. We have a sprinkle of showdown value. So this is like kind of in the middle. Do you have many value hands in your range? Some one of you pointed out that. Not really. Not really. Are my blockers highly relevant? Do I block any nut hands? What are the nut hands here? Nut hands are full houses and straights. Do we block full houses and straights? Absolutely not. Are my, do we unblock the opponent's auto folds? Auto folds are going to be hands like queen x of diamonds and jack x of diamonds. That's a problem, right? Does my bluff tell a credible story? Eh, not really. So, bluffing frequently in this spot. Maybe never. Hmm, 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 hmm. Slightly off formatting there. I always want my formatting to be good. All right, so this is a spot where even though we have queen high on the river, we should probably not bluff. Okay? As you can see, you use the flow chart to figure this out. Let's go through another spot. You raise the three blinds from the button with queen, jack, and diamonds and get a caller in the big blind who's playing tightly. Okay. We see about a third pot on the flop, turn goes check, check, and the big blind checks you on the river. What should we do? King, six, three. We bet a third pot opponent calls. Turns a king, check, check. River's a two. We have queen high. 
Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. What do you think? Akotia says you can hear my voice in your head in tricky spots. Well, that's fun. <laughs> or terrifying. We have Bet Big. We have Bluff. Well, Bluff and Bet Big. Whenever we're saying Bluff, we have to figure out if we're betting big or little. When I say little, by the way, big is like pot or over pot. Small in position is half pot for the most part. Out of position, small is very often really small, like 20% pot. That's kind of neat. We discussed that in this course extensively, in the tournament and cash game course. All you're saying, bet big. All right, well, let's see. Is my opponent capable of folding? Yes. Do I lack showdown value? Uh, not really again. This actually does have some showdown value with the queen high. Do you have many value hands in your range? Yeah. In this spot, we definitely want to value bet a six and better. So we have a lot of value hands in our range. Are my blockers highly relevant? Like, do we block any auto calls? Like, not, not really. Do I unblock any auto folds? Auto folds would include flush draws, right? Do we have any hearts? No, we don't have any hearts. So this would be a yes. Does my bluff tell a credible story? Yes, if, we're, if we are playing it as if we have a um, pocket sevens type hand. So yeah, all right. So now, fine. We're probably going to bluff in this spot. Next, big or small? Do I have zero showdown value? No. We actually have a little bit. A little bit, a little bit. Is the opponent going to call a queen 10? Probably not, but whatever. This, this question is kind of moot in right here. Does the opponent have many marginal made hands to check call flop, check, check, turn, check river? Probably not. A lot of people would value better hand like pocket sevens on the river, so they probably have like a six and worse, right? Do I block many nut hands? Not really. Am I trying to get my opponent off of a strong hand? Not really. Are you representing a nutted hand? No. So, as you see, all of these lead to no. So this is a spot where the answer is no. A small size in this scenario will probably get the job done against this tight player. Now, you may say, doesn't the opponent just have a lot of sixes? If they have a lot of sixes, shouldn't we go bigger? Well, first things first, small is half pot. A lot of people are going to fold to a half pot bet, even with a hand as good as a six here if they are tight. I kind of wish this river was a card higher than a six. It would be a better example, I think. If the river was something like an eight, then I, I definitely love a half pot bet. I think we could justify going a little bit bigger in this spot to really try to get a six to fold. But a lot of the time, the opponent's just going to have ace high here or a busted flush draw. If they have ace high or a busted flush draw, will half pot get it done against a tight player? Yeah. And notice, notice, we are essentially representing a pocket pair, queens to sevens, when we make this play. So this is a spot where I definitely think a small half pot bet will get it done. Okay? Does that all make sense? If you all have any bluffs you want me to talk about, type them in the chat. I'm happy to go through them. If you have any, have, have any questions about bluffing, happy to discuss them. It's important to note that the river is notoriously under bluffed. And this is the reason why poker is so profitable. Because a lot of people get to the river where a lot of money is at stake, and then they screw it up. They primarily, well, you should be primarily betting for value, but they almost entirely bet for value. Most people are afraid to bluff on the river because they don't want to lose their money. So many players, like I see here in the chat, talking, oh, my opponents call my small river bluffs all the time. Yeah, we'll stop betting small, right? A lot of people do not want to put all their money in with nothing. They feel bad whenever they get called, and when they win, they, um, you know, they're happy about it. But it feels so bad whenever you get called, and you have to realize that your feelings do not matter. Hate to break it to you, your feelings are relevant when it comes to a math-based game. Okay, realize that quite often the best play, the optimal play naturally feels bad to most people. It just does. So once you get over that, you'll be okay. A great example of this is a long time ago, long time ago, my dad was playing poker and he was struggling. 
and I was going through his hands, and there were many spots where somebody raised, I say, you gotta rip it in, you gotta rip it in, you gotta rip it in, and he would never do it. He would never, ever, ever, ever do it. And then one day he decided, you know what, I'm probably gonna lose anyway, so I'm gonna start shoving after people raise when I have 20 big blinds. So somebody raised, he ripped it all in, they folded. And that happened about 100 times in that tournament, and he won the tournament. His first tournament win was the first day he started listening to my advice. <laughs> And he said, yeah, first time I did it, I went all in with like 10-9 suited and they folded. And I was so nervous. But then they folded and I won the pot. And then I did it again and again and again and again and again and again. And I won the pot and I won the pot and I won the pot and I won the pot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, sometimes you're going to lose, but you're going to lose anyway if you sit there and blind out. So anyway, most people are afraid to bluff in general. And people are especially afraid to over bluff, well, over bet the river as a bluff. You will see almost no players in small stakes games go for an over bet for bigger than the size of the pot on the river. So what does that mean for you? When your opponents make big bets on the river, you should be exploitatively overfolding. And you need to make sure that you are not easy to play against like your opponents will be. So, you need to make sure that you learn how to bluff well. The King 6 3, King 2 board, you strongly disagree on bluffing. Shouldn't you call with ace high? Yes, you should, but your opponent will not. Health Supreme, you have to realize the question clearly stated the opponent was generally on the tight side. That means that they are very likely to find somewhat big folds on the river. If we said the opponent was a calling station or normal, then. Um, We've got to be a little bit more cautious. Maybe we should even consider going for a bigger bet. That said, you're going to find from a GTO point of view, there are a lot of bluffs that feel bad. Like right there with that queen jack of diamonds, it feels kind of bad to bet half pot because it doesn't feel like it's going to work very often. But it will. You beat everything other than an ace. No, we lose to a two, we lose to a four, we lose to a six. And those will even sometimes fold. The opponent's strategy is highly relevant. Should you randomize your bluffs on the river? Um, from a GTO point of view, sure. I personally just follow the flowchart and do what the flowchart says, and it will come up with roughly the GTO frequency and roughly the GTO size. We actually go through a bunch of examples in the Tournament Masterclass and show that. Should you time bank a little bit whenever you're bluffing to try to make your opponent think something? Um, I think that when people start using the time bank to try to induce something, very often they're just super face up one way or the other. Um, if you time bank every time you bluff and go quickly every time you value bet, obviously that's a problem, right? If you don't get caught bluffing, you're not bluffing enough. Yeah, it's true. And when you get caught bluffing, don't feel bad. Don't, don't think you screwed up because quite often you should bluff and you just happen to run into a call. You know, sometimes they're supposed to call. Should we three bet bluff the river more often and make everyone think it's the nuts? Um, depends on your opponent's strategy. Are you thinking about bet sizing in terms of minute defense frequency we're giving the opponent? Not really. I follow the flow chart. Obviously, don't bet, like, minimum in position. That's usually not a good strategy. Do you think people bluff less live? Yes, because they're ashamed to blow, show the bluff. Yes. Also, to be fair, um, most people online are just better at poker. And as you get better at poker, you learn how to bluff decently well. What if you always time bank just to make the other players not want to play pots with you? I think that uh, people don't care when they're playing online. Playing live, uh, we'll just start calling the clock on you. I remember one time I was playing this tournament. It was me and Steve O'Dwyer and this one other guy, and I think maybe one other player. We were playing four-handed in like a $25,000 tournament. And we're all playing reasonably quickly, except for this one guy who tanks for forever on every decision. And we just start clocking him <laughs> every hand. Me and Steve just take turns. Take turns clocking him. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And eventually, the tournament director gave him 10 seconds per hand, or 10 seconds per action, as he should, because he was taking forever. All right. Bluffing is dishonest. Ooh, it's so bad to, to play within the rules of the game. When should Check raising is also really nasty. It's a nasty thing. When should you show the bluff? You have to ask, what am I trying to accomplish by showing the bluff? The problem with showing the bluff is that, if anything, it's going to make your opponents call you more on the river. Do you really want to be getting called a lot on the river? Not really. 
Not really, because you want to be able to get your bluffs through in the future. So that's not good. I mean, it's good if you're playing super nitty, but do you really want to be playing super nitty? Like, not really. So that's not a good reason to show. So what other good reasons can we have? There's one primary good reason, and that's when it will make your opponent go off the deep end and go on massive tilt because they got bluffed. Most people are not that feeble-minded. Now, if you are playing against someone who is feeble-minded, then maybe? Maybe. I personally don't do that very much because I don't want to be viewed as the antagonist at the table because I like making good relationships with people. I've learned that if uh, there's a little bit of value in giving up perhaps a little bit of equity and maybe getting someone to tilt off in exchange for making people like you. A lot of people think the goal is to win as much money as possible from the specific poker game right now in this exact hand. And to be fair, there's nothing wrong with that. But the game is a little bit bigger than exactly on the felt. Um, that said, some people are cool with it, right? Like, if you're playing fun, casual game, people like showing each other bluffs. I mean, sure, right? It's a, it's, a weird, it's a weird dynamic. It's a weird dynamic. I definitely get that some people play the antagonist in poker and they play the antagonist in life. And, you know, nothing wrong with that. Just you got to realize that that's going to make people not want to work with you outside of the poker table. What's the best way to bluff a GTO player? Play GTO. <clears throat> In general, let's talk about the spectrum of bluffing aggression. People typically have one of these six levels of aggression on the river. Most people have no balance. They have no bluffs on the river, and they only bet for value in the small stakes games. Period. They just don't bluff. Or they are unbalanced. They are severely unbalanced, and they have no clear logic when they choose their bluffs. There are people who are somewhat unbalanced, where they moderately bluff, usually with the most obvious bluffing candidates. Some people are more balanced, where they slightly underbluff the river, turning additional hands into those extra bluffs. They start to play kind of well. Then we have the well-balanced players. These are my most world-class players. And to be fair, I'm not going to say this is as good as you could possibly hope for, but this is about as good as you could possibly hope for, where you are capable of turning the non-obvious hands into the additional bluffs if necessary. And then there are the perfectly balanced players that play the GTO strategy. And you're going to find out that the GTO strategy actually does bluff a lot. That said, most of your opponents will rarely bluff enough in real life, so you in turn should auto-fold. And you need to make a point to try to be more balanced with your bluffs. Okay? Headjack opens, 2.2. We defend 9-6 of spades. Flop comes, ace, 9-6. Check, they bet, we call. Turns a 7. Check, they bet, we call. River's a 10. He jams. This is not a spot where we can bluff because we're calling. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody. Thanks for subscribing for three months. T-dubs. Thank you, T-dubs. In your game, there's only one... Uh, okay, there's only one player in your game who will bluff the river. Good! They're Welt Rats, says you enjoy the show. I'm glad to hear it. If you enjoy it, click like, click subscribe. Faraz approach, does Faraz approach the live table differently, looking to mini-tilt the opponents? A lot of people look to tilt the opponents. There's nothing wrong with that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with looking to tilt the opponents. I, 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 mean, I did my best to make that crystal clear. It's important to realize that some people can very clearly disassociate poker from outside of poker, but I think most people cannot. If there's a player who is like a hardcore antagonist at the poker table, who just does stuff to get on your nerves, who plays aggressively, who tries to show you the bluff to tilt you, some people are cool with that. And to be fair, most good players are cool with that. But I think most recreational players... It turns out at the high stakes, most recreational players are the players who are really good at business and life outside of poker. Most of those players are not quite so good at disassociating the two. And do you want to make those people not really like you? And I would say the answer is generally no. You want them to like you, right? Simple as that. And I mean, you can try to be nice and friendly, but at the same time, if someone generally likes you, they are going to give you opportunities. Whereas if people generally do not like you, they are not. Maybe it's weird that I even view the game like that to some extent, but I've learned from many years of sitting there with my sunglasses and headphones and hoodie on and not talking to anybody 
that literally zero doors open for you being like that. I've also learned that being an antagonist generally closes doors. And to be fair, Faraz is uh, not even an antagonist in my mind, but he certainly is loose and aggressive and battly, right? And plenty of doors open for him. He's a nice, um, talkative guy. So maybe there is some way that you can be kind of in there doing it while at the same time keeping your doors open. I mean, maybe I'm just not good at that. So I've learned just be nice and don't, don't, uh, don't be, don't, you know, treat people like you'd like to be treated. Simple as that. Simple as that. Let's go through a hand or two from a GTO point of view. All right. Button opens, big blind calls. Flop comes, nine, seven, five. Big blind checks, button checks back. Why is button checking back in this flop? Well, because they should check back this board a lot of the time because it's good for the big blinds range. Check, check. Turn is a two. Big blind bets 120% pot. You ever betting 120% pot? Most people don't because they don't play well. This is a spot where when it goes check, check, big blind has a lot of very good hands on this board and they want to start polarizing the range a lot of the time. Certainly they're going to check sometimes, obviously, but this is a spot where you're going to want to be betting big. Button calls. Hmm, button has a lot of marginal made hands here for the most part. Now, this shows out of positions equity on the river. Out of position is the big blind. How much equity does out of position have on various rivers? Which cards are best for the big blind? Well, if you think about it, big blinds will be betting with a lot of gut shots, right? Eights and sixes. And then a lot of nut hands, right? So an eight and a six are going to be particularly good for the big blind because those complete the straights. Every other card is not particularly amazing. Also, even though the big blinds going to be betting in this spot with like two pairs and bottom set and whatnot, um, the pairs are not so great because if you think about Button's uh, check check range on the flops, it's going to contain a lot of nine sevens and fives. So when a nine seven or five comes, that's really going to nail the Button's check check range on the flop that calls a big turn bet. Okay. So here's how the equities line up on various rivers. Meaning, out of position is roughly neutral on the big cards. Nine seven and five is pretty bad. Ace and six is really good because quite often a Button would bet an eight or a six on the flop or just like fold out a random six on the turn. And the low cards are roughly neutral. Okay, here is how often and with what size the out of position player and the big blind should be betting on various rivers. Okay, whenever you get a river that's really good for you, like an eight or a six, as we see, you have the very, very high equity. In this spot, you're often be betting frequently using a small size or a medium size. Whenever you get a really, really good river, you often bet small. As we see, the dark red size here is a very big bet. Light red size here is a small bet. This color is medium. This color is like pot. So we have a little bit of pot betting here. Lots of, I think, like half pot betting and a lot of like 20% pot betting. Okay? And relatively little checking, 25%. So on these rivers, we are betting small and frequently. The rivers that are bad for us, 9, 7, and 5, we're often betting infrequently and big because we're betting pretty polarized. So see nine, seven, and five, we're often betting using the, what's this, half pot? No, this is the uh, pot size bet, I think. Yeah, I could be wrong about this. We'll take a look at some examples here in just a second. We're using the big, bigger bet sizes on these. Remember the two is also kind of bad. See, relatively bad river for whatever reason because I guess it's essentially blank and that means a nine, seven, and five is still very good for the opponent. And we're betting infrequently on that as well. All the other rivers are like neutral-ish. We're usually betting on the, you know, betting somewhat frequently using mostly medium sizes. Okay, so let's take a look at an eight. This is what our range looks like on an eight river. Nine, seven, five, two, eight. Remember, check, check, flop, over bet, turn, get called. Here we are on the river. On the river, so it's a 60% size. We have a 120% pot bet, a 60% pot bet, 125% pot bet, and check. We're checking the eights, very clear marginal made hands, right? What else are we checking? Not much. Checking a few straights, checking a few nines, checking sporadic ace high. Right? Makes sense. Then we are doing a lot of small betting. Remember I said we're doing a lot of small betting and uh, medium betting on the eight and the six river because this river is really good for us. Why is it really good for us? Because we have all these sixes. Right? Notice we're also value betting a nine. 
You may say, we can value bet a nine in this spot? Turns out, yes. Turns out, yes. It's awesome seeing these percentage and comparing it to how your mind thinks. Well, if you like this, let me pull this over here. We have loads and loads and loads of this stuff in this course. Loads and loads and loads and loads and loads. This is just for the river, by the way. I mean, clearly we do this for pre-flop, on the flop, on the turn, on the river. So in this spot, we do a lot of small betting. And if we look at how we are structuring our betting range, you're going to find that the bigger bet size is almost always polarized. The smaller bet size is almost always condensed, meaning doesn't have a whole lot of nuts and not a whole lot of garbage. Um, so let's take a look. In this spot, our 60% bet size is a lot of straights and sets and some top pairs and garbage. Okay? Our 25% bet size is a few nuts. You always want to make sure you put some nuts in your uh, in your in your small bet size as well. A lot of top pairs. 67% of our range is top pairs, and just a few bluffs. Notice our range is roughly 20% uh, or sorry, 16% bluffs here. 16% bluffs, 16% nuts, 67% thin value hands. How does a beginner approach this? It looks so daunting. Well, you got to realize, I threw all of you into the deep end with this uh, this show today. This is uh, very, very deep into the course. This is slide 600, 639 of the post-flop section. We already have uh, about 1,000 more pre-flop. So uh, we're pretty, pretty in the deep end at this point. Why do you think pairing the flop on the river is more profitable for the button? Because on the river, too, they're going to have a whole lot of 9s, 7s, and 5s. So the 2 doesn't really change a whole lot because also the... Um, Big blind's not going to bet a two on the turn very often. Okay, let's look at a nine. Remember, a nine is a card where the uh, big the big blind's going to bet somewhat infrequently. We see them checking about half the time, and when they do bet, they're usually going to bet big. So we see actually all in. I don't know exactly what the pot size is here, but it's this is a big all in. Uh, twenty three percent of the time, one hundred twenty percent pot, twenty percent of the time, and then almost no small betting. So we see here on a river nine, we are betting big or jamming with our nines, with our straights, with our sets, right? Lots of that. Checking some nines to induce bluffs. Remember, you want to make sure in every range you have, you have some nuts. So we see, like for example, well, effective nuts, right? I realize ace nine is not the super nuts, but it's effective nuts. Ace nine jams all in sometimes. It bets 120% pot sometimes. It bets 60% uh, pot sometimes. And it checks sometimes. Okay. <laughs> And then we're checking with a lot of marginal made hands. What are marginal made hands here? Well, it's going to be, what's it going to be? It's going to be some sevens. It's going to be some high cards, right? Like ace high. It's going to be some stuff like bottom pair probably. Yeah, we see like counterfeit five, two, seven, five. Makes sense, right? Ace highs. Interesting to see king highs here checking. Surprised they're not just like all bluffing, but they don't. Um, what is bluffing? Ace three is bluffing, oddly enough. This is, this is where GTO finds the bluffs, and uh, us mere humans don't. Notice six high does not bluff all that often. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. We have jack ten bluffing a lot. We see jack ten and queen jack. So all these high cards here, king high, like two over cards are bluffing a lot. Why are these bluffing a lot? I gotta presume because they block um, king nine, queen nine, jack nine, pocket kings, pocket queens, pocket jacks, right? Where 6-3, notice, doesn't block anything, right? 6-3 blocks some of their auto folds, right? So this is a good example where we're bluffing king high that has more showdown value than 6 high, but that's because 6 high has really bad blockers, whereas king high and queen high has really good blockers, right? So see here, the blockers are very, very relevant. Finally, caught me live. Well, I'm here Monday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time, sporadically at other times. David Goodman, Ryan, Ryan O'Donnell's Spin and Go course is in the Poker Coaching Premium section in the course, Courses tab. There's a Courses tab with a lot of courses. If it's not there for some reason, send us an email. It should be there. We have a gigantic course on Spin and Goes by one of the absolute best Spin and Go players in the world, if you're into that. And he does webinars sporadically on PokerCoaching.com as well, so make sure you get into those. All right, contrasting an all-in range to the checking range on the river. You may be surprised to see when we check the river here, we give up almost every time. Kind of weird to think, but you're going to find that very often GTO loads up the bets. GTO very often loads up the bets 
as much as it possibly can, and sometimes it leaves the, che leaves the checking range hanging out to dry. And this is an example of this. Um, as we see here, say his live classes are missing. I'll look into it. Thank you for letting me know. If you haven't, if you ever, by the way, if anything's ever like missing on pokercoaching.com or if you can't find it, send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com because uh, it might be. <laughs> and I want to make sure everything is there for you. Okay. So this is a spot where, as you see, we are leaving our checking range hanging out to dry. We do protect it a little bit with a few nuts so that hopefully our ace high sometimes wins at the showdown, right? But for the most part, we are just giving up when we check. But look at our betting range. Super polarized. Very nut heavy. So there you go. Okay. Let's take a look at uh, an in-position spot. I'll show you what all we're skipping here. Lots and lots and lots of GTO spots. Betting from in-position on the river. All right. Let's take a look at this spot. All right. Button raises, big blind calls, flop comes, ace, jack, five. Big blind checks, button bets, two-thirds pot, big blind calls, okay? Turn is a two, check, button bets 120% pot. Are you 120% potting it here? What do you think? Most people don't, but in a GTO world, you definitely should be betting big in this spot with your good but vulnerable hands plus some bluffs, okay? We bet big, big blind calls. Big blind range is actually pretty good here. Rivers of two, big blind checks. What do we do? As you see, when we bet big on the turn and the big blind calls, we actually don't have very good equity at all on basically every river. <laughs> so think back to the previous example. When we don't have great equity, what does our betting range look like? Turns out if you look at a lot of these GTO simulations that look like this, you'll start to figure out roughly what your strategy looks like in a lot of spots. And, interestingly enough, you can kind of predict what bet size you're going to be using with various portions of your range. And like I just said, in this spot, when Big Blind calls a turn, they're going to have a lot of pretty good hands. So when they call the turn, they're going to have a lot of aces and they're going to have a lot of jacks, right? We want to keep draws in right. No, you usually want to get draws to fold, if at all possible. If you can get draws to fold, that's fantastic, because draws have good equity. You don't want to let draws see the river for cheap. If you let draws see for cheap, they're not screwing up. You want your opponents to screw up. Obviously, on the turn, we're going to have various bet sizes, not just 120% pot. Um, that said, can we take a lot of draws out of the opponent's range? I mean, fl good flush draws? No, obviously. Queen 10 offsuit? Obviously, yes. You know, come on. Come on. Okay, so in this scenario, as you see, we're going to be betting very infrequently, but big when we do bet the ace and the jack, most likely. Let's take a look. Turns out, infrequently and big across the board. Why infrequently and big across the board? Because we don't have an equity advantage on any real card. Remember in the previous example, we had like 60% equity on the 8 and the 6, and we showed that you're betting very frequently on the 8 and the 6. Here we don't have a big equity advantage on any river, and that's going to lead to us betting roughly half the time. And when we do bet, we are usually betting big. Louis Philippe, who runs the Poker coaching study sessions. Make sure you get in those, by the way. Get in the poker coaching Discord. He's teaching the students a ton. He says, notice how equities run close when the opponent calls the big turn bet. We don't have any good rivers. Yeah, it's true. But we're smashing them on the turn. And one thing you will find is that whenever you start using overbets on the turn, a lot of people have no clue how to respond. Only 78 likes. If you all enjoyed the show, click like, click subscribe, click the notification bell. I'd appreciate it. You know, the person in charge of my YouTube said, we have great analytics on every show besides this show, this Monday morning show. If we don't get the numbers up, we may have to cancel it. So I don't want to cancel it. I like this show. This is a lot of fun for me. So if you like this show, click the like and subscribe button, please. And if you don't like it, well, don't worry. We may end it soon. <laughs> All right. So anyway, here we are going pretty big, roughly half the time we do bad. Let's take a look at the River 8. River 8. As we see, we're going to be betting our best hands, big, checking everything else. Um, what are our best hands on ace, jack, five, two, eight? Our best hands are going to be two pair and better, pretty much. Uh, we see ace, king even checks the river a lot. Ace, king, and ace, queen do a lot of checking. You may be surprised to think you can't go for three streets of value with the ace, king in this spot. Uh, no. Turns out you can't. All right. 
So we're betting big with these, betting big with two pairs, and then we are going to be bluffing. Um, what are we bluffing with? All sorts of nonsense, most likely, right? So we see all sorts of nonsense going for the big bets. Sporadic nonsense. Sure. What is checking? Some aces are checking. King high is going to be doing a decent amount of checking. Jack's going to be doing a lot of checking, right? Um, interesting to see... Oh, sorry. Five, yeah, fives are doing a lot of checking. Under pairs are doing a lot of checking. Eights are doing a lot of checking. So marginal made hands check. Nuts are betting. And some bluffs are betting. And as we see here, when we bet, we have a set or two pair better. And also garbage, right? Makes a lot of sense. You can start a second channel for the live videos. The problem is when you start a second channel, inevitably nobody goes there. We'd have like seven viewers. I know how that works. Don't really want seven viewers for my live stuff. All right, let's take a look at a river king. It's gonna be a pretty good river for us, at least in terms of connecting with some of our nuts. So now, because we're gonna have more two pairs now, right? <clears throat> so now we're betting with two pair and better again. Oh, this is king of spades. Ooh, spicy king of spades. What are we, what are we looking at on king of spades? This is gonna be a good river, right? Yeah, so take a look at this. Notice the king of spades is actually, is it the best river? I think king of spades is the best river for us. Um, as we see here, we're betting frequently, and this is because our flushes come in, but also we can still value bet with two pair for the most part. Good two pair, at least. Let's see if all two pair bets. I, I bet it doesn't. Um, yeah, so we see like jack five here does not bet. So this is a spot where as the board gets um, more and more coordinated, we inevitably don't go for such thin value. We're, all these hands here are, that are betting are going to be flushes, and um, we're going to be bluffing with whatever we can find. In this spot, I gotta presume whatever, literally whatever we can find, we're gonna be bluffing with in this spot. Notice the kings check, right? Kings go for checks, so we see queen ten is a straight. Oh my gosh, we just have literally everything. Um, are these jacks bluffing? I think these jacks. I don't think maybe these are all spades. These are probably all spades. Um, let's find some hands that are bluffing a lot. So we see six five here, probably betting. Well, it's actually six, we see 6-5 betting some portion of the time. We see 5-4 betting some portion of the time. So these are clearly not spades, right? So we're having to use bottom pairs as bluffs of the spot. Notice 4s, 3s, and 2s are being used as bluffs. Interesting to see, right? Because in this spot, if you think about our range, we really just don't have a whole lot of garbage. Okay? And as we see here, on the river... When we're bluffing, we're betting, we're value betting, I'm sorry, when we're betting, we're value betting for 120% pot all in with flushes, straights, sets, two pairs, bottom pairs, or low pairs, and nothing. And this nothing is very often going to have a spade blocker, I got to presume, although maybe it, sometimes it doesn't because this is a river that's pretty good for us. Um, definitely worth noting, though, two pair can go for value. How many of you go for the 140% pot jam on the river? Notice, GTO does not use any small bets. Well, 1.75%, you could ignore that for all practical purposes. So GTO uses no small bets on this river. So you're only jamming or you are checking. And a lot of people are surprised to see that in this spot, two pair can rip it in for value. You may think, well, what my opponent call with? My opponent call with any worse hands? Yeah, they will. You give him a hand like ace queen. You give him a hand like uh, jack five suited. You give him a hand like... Um, I don't know, give my hand like any ace randomly. A lot of people, like you all said, a lot of your opponents call with any ace. A lot of these hands are going to find calls on the river. And the nice thing about this is that you can just load up your bluffing range. Well, as we see here, in this spot, we are bluffing, what is this, 30, 32% of the time. And notice, we could probably even fit in more bluffs. I, I realize, you, if, for the studious people out there, you may say, we're over betting the pot, right? Can't we have more than two-thirds bluffs? I'm sorry, more than two-thirds, what am I saying? More than one-third bluffs. We can have what? Uh, 30, 38% bluffs, something like that. Someone do the math. So in this spot, we can have 38% bluffs, but we only have 30, 32. Why do we only have 32% bluffs? You know why? Take a second, think about it. Who are these opponents, LOL? Hmm. If you have the queen of spades here, I gotta presume you're supposed to call a lot, by the way. Who are these opponents? Good players. You give any good player the queen of spades here, they're going to find a lot of calls. We actually go through these spots and look at them from the other, other point of view, by the way. 
Maybe we'll do that later at some point. Or you can just sign up for pokercoaching.com slash valentines and get a lovely discount. Is this cash or tournament? Doesn't make a difference. This, these, these are the early levels of a tournament or in a cash game. Why can we not have the full 38% bluffs? Does anybody know? Nobody knows. I'll tell you why. Because all of our value bets don't win. As some of your value bets do not win on the river, two pair does not, is not always good here, right? And sets are not always good here. And straights are not always good here. As some of your value bets don't win when you value shove and get called, you have to have fewer bluffs in your range to account for that. Okay? Watching live from North Korea. Hello. Hope you enjoy the show. You barely over bet the river as a bluff live. V, I will tell you, exploitatively, I over bluff an insane amount. I'm actually in the process of making a new course. How to crush small stakes cash games for pokercoaching.com. And I played a bunch of 5 cent, 10 cent, 10 cent, 25 cent, 25 cent, 50 cent, and 50 cent dollar cash games online. And I made a lot of bluffs. A lot, a lot, a lot of bluffs on the river over bet. So anyway, this is a spot where as we have more hands on the river that we're value betting, that are profitable value bets, but still lose sometimes, we have to have fewer bluffs. Now, if our range was perfectly polarized, meaning we had like nut flushes that were always good and nothing, then we would be way closer. Well, we would, we would have that 38% 38 bluffs or whatever it is. Okay. John says, OMG, really? Yeah. Turns out one of my most popular courses on pokercoaching.com is on small stakes cash games, but it's like five years old. So we're going to go back and uh, completely revamp it, completely update it. I went through, I played a lot of live cash or online cash games. I crushed them, by the way. <laughs> so that was good. Um, there were a lot of limpers in the small stakes games. I was surprised at how bad the players played. I got in a ton of bluffs. I mean, I'm telling you, I literally did exactly what I outlined here. We went, we went through the flow chart, sometimes in my head, because I was playing quickly. And the games were great. So anyway, that'll be out eh, sometime soon. I think we're aiming for mid-March to have that, that available. We're trying it a little bit differently this time, where I'm going to present a PowerPoint on a topic, and then we're going to have all the hands I played in the sessions back to back to back to back to back cut up right after it. So that's going to be like, we're going to have the whole sessions available for you, of course. But we'll also have clipped sessions with just those specific hands. So like one minute clips of those hands. We'll see how it goes. How'd you do yesterday? I watched the Super Bowl. We had the Rams, so that's good. Not not the not the minus four. Everybody knows. Everybody knows minus four is a bad number. My greatest Turkish fan. Well, thank you for being here, Negrad. Glad you're here. That's gonna be it for today. Hope you enjoyed today's show. Let me go back and find the flow chart so that you all can screenshot it one more time if you're late. Here's a bluffing decision flow chart. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, click like, click subscribe. If you want to give yourself or someone else a gift, check out pokercoaching.com slash valentines. Should you look for a table with a lot of limping? Yeah, because limping is really, really, really bad. If your opponents are really, 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 really bad, that's good for you. You make money when people screw up. Louis Fleep, if you're here, are we doing the study sessions right after this? I think we are. I think we do study sessions. 10 a.m., Monday, plus some other days. Type in the schedule. Feel free. If you are in the Poker Coaching Discord, go hop in. Study with Louis Philippe. Everybody else there. They do great work. They go through whatever spots you all are working hard on. And um, Louis Philippe actually sends me really good notes where they go through all sorts of um, very, very interesting GTO spots. And uh, I learn a lot going through the notes. So thanks for that. Yeah, so they start the study session right now. So make sure you get in that in the Poker Coaching Discord. Go to pokercoaching.com, click in the community tab, and it'll take you right to the Discord. Thanks for the little brain fuel. You're very welcome. Check out brainfuel.com. I don't know. This stuff is good. I enjoy it. Brainfuel.com. I think promo code Poker Coaching still works. You can get a discount. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9, 10 a.m. Eastern time is when the study sessions are. So make sure you get in that. That's going to be it for me today. Good luck. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. And have a great week. I'll talk to you later. Happy Valentine's.